affected by it. And every morning we would go to the court and out of these big corporate cars would tumble at least eight men and women in black and march up the steps and here our little lot would come along and the uh, big corporate limos would arrive at lunchtime and at night and take them away and we were struggling to raise enough money to pay. We were having raffles and sausage sizzles and just trying to find enough money to, to pay for our witnesses. Oh, In June yeah. 1999, after these people had actually um, spent three weeks presenting their evidence, the radio network, and they drew it right out to make it you know, more expensive, and the court ran, actually ran out of time before our evidence was presented. And um, they adjourned um, the hearing for two months, and the only evidence that had been presented for the residents was um, from... Uh, a man that Dr. Cherry had met called Professor Abelin, and he was a Swiss um, researcher who had headed up the team at the Schwarzenberg AM uh, five-year research. And the symptoms were so similar to what we were experiencing there at Ruia. And the other person who represented the residents, these were our only two witnesses before the adjournment, was an ex Telstra Dr. Hocking, and he'd um, done a very thorough research on harm, uh, cluster harm occurring near Sydney radio towers, which was very similar. And he um, examined several of the Aruria residents and said that they had symptoms of radiation sickness, and uh, I was one of the ones that he diagnosed with these symptoms. So what are the symptoms of radiation sickness? Well, for me it was loss of hair, Oozing blisters on my face where the radio frequency focused into amalgam in my teeth and, um, and through my wire rim glasses, it, I had blisters wherever the metal the, with the skin. Uh, skin sores, loss of balance. You, you, you lose your balance. It's, it's, I think it's the oscillation that makes you fall over. And very, very painful ears. Um, it's almost like you're deaf, but then you get this high-pitched whining noise and it, it, it's very painful. Um, heart palpitations. A total loss of memory. I mean, I, I, I couldn't even remember what my own name was. Oh, no. And um, my voice was lured, and, and it was like I'd aged 20 years and two years, uh, gone from being very fit, able to run around my farm where I couldn't even walk 20 metres without sitting down. I'd been physically very, very uh, strong. I had swollen lumps all over my body and terrible bone pain. Um, I suddenly developed asthma and just was totally exhausted. I mean, there's a lot of other symptoms that are involved. It just depends. I think with each different person, um, the frequencies seem to affect where the weakness is in your system. Um, some people developed cancer, some people had heart attack around the area within, and it's only a very small population, within um, a K and a half of the tower, I think there were six people who had had heart bypasses. And quite a, the heart, the effect on the heart, it affects the, the heart and the, and the brain, where you've got the electrical systems. Sorry, I, I'm, I'm just here confirming that. Now, for me, uh, around the Christchurch quake uh, before and after, I had hair loss, uh, joint pain, uh, couldn't remember my own name. I remember one day, quite recently, sitting there, 10 minutes it took me to get into my own network because I couldn't remember my passwords. I have had swollen lymph glands. The hair loss has only just stopped and we've just... Do you live near a radio and... tower? Yes, indeed we do, uh, which yes. uh, sits, sits over the uh, police station here in my town, interestingly. Now, I was fainting, uh, you know, passing out at work. Uh, there was... I, I can really relate to this. Now, my, my daughter um, ha now has serious asthma and the exhaustion. Uh, I completely understand. And the, One and of these... the most Interesting sites to go to um, is is the site that Dr. Barry Trower in England has actually got. Um, for anybody wanting to look this up, there's a um, a frequency which is called the Tetra frequency, which actually comes off uh, police stations. And he was actually asked by the police who were who were getting quite sick to do a presentation to the British Parliament, which he did. And he is an ex he's worked in the Ministry of Defence uh, developing and working with electromagnetic uh, radiation, so he understands the effects very well. And his presentation will perhaps help you to understand that Tetra 
is an extremely high and seems to be a very dangerous frequency, which is probably what you're getting from that being near the police station. Thank you, Penny. What happened uh, when the court adjourned? Well, it was really weird because a few days after the court case, my mother was at a party and one of my cousins was on the board of Radio Network and mother had been at the hearing supporting us and she was absolutely furious when she saw these very rich people arrive in their big cars and how we were struggling to raise money and the way they'd drawn the court case out deliberately and no one had investigated what was happening and she said she, she, she challenged him and said, how can you possibly be part of a company that is doing this to these poor sick people? And he said, look, I don't know what you're talking about. The radio network directors have never authorised to be part of an a, um, a, um, environment court hearing. I've got no idea what you're talking about. Now, he's a very genuine man, and he obviously did not have any idea what he was talking about, and they hadn't authorised or didn't seem to have authorised um, for the Chapman trip to actually represent uh, the radio network at this hearing to make it legal. So again, this was all very confusing. Mm. D Penny, did you happen to think that his extraordinary claim that Chapman Tripp had proceeded without director's consent was true? Well, I don't know, um, but within two days of that party, Chapman Tripp um, approached um, our lawyer, and our lawyer, um, I, I don't know what had actually happened because um, they asked our Greenpeace lawyer to... to present an offer to us, we, we had a meeting, and they said at this offer they would not add any more FM stations, they would not add the two more, they would take one FM station off in 20 months, they would pay the residents' costs, but the conditions were the residents didn't talk about the case for 20 years and didn't have a health study for 20 years. If the residents broke that agreement, they would be fined $10,000 and another FM station would be added. Wow, that's that's pretty amazing stuff. Did the did the residents accept that? It is pretty amazing stuff because they've been busy telling us for the last four years that there was no harm from these emissions, and yet they were trying to gag us, and they were prepared to pay our costs, and um, just the whole thing just just was quite extraordinary. Um, a lot of the the Greenpeace lawyer had been very gung ho that we were winning the case, and he was very cowed, like something serious had happened that had really affected his representation of us. It was like he was saying, I think you should accept that offer. And um, the residents were so terrified of two more FM stations being added, they were actually prepared to accept the gagging orders, except for about three of us who, who totally refused. We just said there's no way we're going to accept the gagging, ga gagging extras. Um, and um, so the next day, um, Chapman Tripp came back with the same offer, uh, but without the gagging orders. And um, our lawyer told us that we should accept it because the evidence that had been presented to the court showed that the national radiation monitoring was so low that even when they put four on, it would still um, come within what they call the New Zealand Safe, safe Standard. So we were just... We just thought, oh, well, we'll just have to accept it. At least they're going to take one off and maybe they'll be more responsible. And um, we don't have much choice because our lawyer is busy advising us to accept it. So it was very much, um, it was very much made under threat. We really didn't have much choice. So the decision sounds like it was, it was a 99 decision, wasn't it? It sounds like it was yes. made under duress and intimidation. It was total duress and intimidation of them doubling the stations and, and the sick residents. So we were just exhausted from trying to raise money and trying to find out and having meetings. And when your brain and memory and your whole systems, you know, it's like having, I think, um, chronic procedure syndrome, according to research, is very linked to exposure to electromagnetic radiation. And, of course, it's the disease of the last 25 years. So it does sort of make sense on that. And when you suffer from something like that to actually try and run a court case against something as big as these corporations are with their endless supplies of money is very intimidating. So uh, I don't remember ever seeing the Uhuru hearing reported, Penny. Can it, our listeners read more about this anywhere? Well, it, it was the, again, this we come to this extraordinary situation is that the Shirley School uh, cell phone car case, which was conducted about six months prior to this, 
It was written up in the newspaper every single day, huge big write-ups about it. Now that was a hypothetical case about what might happen. The Aruria case was showing definitely there was harm caused from exposure within the New Zealand standard. And of course this is vitally important to the health and well-being of people all over New Zealand and all over the world because all over the world people are struggling um, to, to um, cope with the effects they're getting from these transmission towers. It's not just in New Zealand, it's, it's everywhere. This, well, not everywhere. Um, it's in the US, United Kingdom, Germany, Australia, Canada. Um, people that seem to be involved in the US military machine and the original standard was actually adopted um, under the US um, military advice that it would... Um, no, the, the extraordinary thing about um, the Aruria uh, appeal court hearing was that there was nothing reported in the newspaper at all. Uh, six months before there'd been the Shirley School cell phone tower hearing, which was related to a cell phone tower being, was going to be put at a school, and there were a lot of objections to that. Now that was hypothetical, that was what might happen to the children. The Aruria evidence that we presented showed there was serious harm within the New Zealand standard and that this should have been well publicised all over New Zealand, all over the world, because all over the world people are actually experiencing similar effects from inappropriately located towers. Now the Shirley School Town now, the school now has three towers and they say there's no problem, they're using that as a legal precedent and no one has ever investigated the harm to those children at, at all, which is absolutely shocking. The New Zealand standard uh, is, is absolutely the same standard as what you actually have in the US, the exposure standard there complies with what they call ICNIRP. And ICNIRP is actually set um, by uh, industry representation, the same as the New Zealand standard is represented uh, by industry representation. And it's very interesting that the US standard, New Zealand, Australia, US, Canada, Germany, are uh, all hundreds of times higher exposure than you get in Russia, China, Switzerland, Belgium, and many other countries who have actually recognised that the ICNIRP standard is far too high. Oh now, now, the history of the standard actually in the US goes back to the US military, who um, I've got the origins of the standard, the research that actually shows they knew there were, there were health problems, but they wanted to keep the standard up to a certain level of exposure because if they... 